I'm only going to talk, say a few words really, just to put things in context, I guess, uh, around the circular economy and what's happening in Scotland. Uh, just a few words before I introduce Mark. Uh, I mean, obviously you'll be glad it is a few words uh, because I'm not the main uh, attraction tonight, it is Mark. Uh, so the quicker we get to, to hearing from Mark, uh, the better. Uh, but also the other thing is just a few words for me because I'm not really an expert, well, I'm not an expert in manufacturing. Uh, particularly circular economy and manufacturing, so I don't think I'd be able to hold you or captivate you for, many, for very much longer uh, than just a few minutes. So it's really important, and that's the whole purpose of this lecture series, is really to, to bring in the experts, uh, some global experts as well, people who are, who are working in this field uh, with, uh, with companies uh, really as change leaders and really ahead of the curve uh, and, and pace setting uh, around the circular economy, not just doing it, learning and really tra trailblazing so others can follow. So really privileged to have Mark along tonight. But what I do know uh, about uh, the circular economy is that it's a huge opportunity for industry, uh, not just around the world, but particularly here in Scotland, in terms of growth, in terms of jobs, uh, resilience, uh, export potential uh, and global recognition. And now, we're already here in Scotland, as hopefully many of you are aware, probably one of the leading company, if not the leading company, one of the leading com countries uh, in the world when it comes to the circular economy. We've, that's been recognized by uh, an award that was presented by the World Economic Forum in Davos just last year uh, in terms of the progress, the policy space uh, that has been uh, delivered by the Scottish government here, but more importantly by a number of partners, including ourselves, Scottish Enterprise, Education Scotland, uh, Skills Development Scotland, uh, a whole range of partners who have come together to actually start delivering practical action on the ground to support the transition to a circular economy. And the heart of that is the manufacturing uh, industry uh, in Scotland. That is really the kind of opportunity that exists for us all in Scotland to really do something significant. Uh, it's estimated that as little as 10% of the raw materials used in manufacturing actually end up in the product at the end of uh, the end of the process, about 10%. So that's really to demonstrate the kind of unsustainability, uh, unsustainability of the linear economy that we're kind of locked into uh, in some respects at the moment and the importance of shifting away from that. There's also the increasing challenges around uh, the price and accessibility of those raw materials uh, which are facing companies uh, every day and the, the trend is, is to some extent the pressure is getting uh, more considerable. Uh, even I was listening to, uh, I think there was a Scottish Chamber of Commerce report just this morning uh, obviously, you know, under the pressures of uh, the pound, the value of the pound, there's, a, there's acute pressures on the price of raw materials for businesses. So even the geopolitical things that are going on, as well as the, obviously the environmental issues around uh, access to these raw materials are really uh, causing issues for uh, individual companies and key industries, not just in Scotland, but around the world. So that is why we are seeing increasing number of manufacturing companies beginning to, to generate the new revenue streams through the adoption of different business models around leasing, around asset management, take back, repair, remanufacturing, reversing that trend in a kind of low margin world and realizing the true value of their products uh, again and again. So this is about how they maximize the ownership of those materials through the life cycle. So these are the ones that are, these companies are the ones that are leading the way uh, and you know, recognizing new areas of profit profitability, accessing new markets, and diversifying their customer base. We did some work here in Scotland around the, the potential for that uh, a couple of years ago and recognized, even if we just looked at eight key manufacturing subsectors, uh, and we recognized that there was a potential benefit uh, of about a billion or just over a billion pounds uh, if they started to adopt circular economy uh, business models. So it's significant uh, in terms of impact to the, the Scottish economy by going down this route. So our work at Zero Waste Scotland, just a little bit about us, is really about how do we help and support the transition. Uh, there's two key strategies that sit behind us. One is the kind of Scottish Government's circular economy strategy, uh, making things last, which came out in 2016. Then there's the Manufacturing Action Plan for Scotland, which came out uh, at the beginning of last year, which sets out the framework, not just for the circular economy, but the whole manufacturing industry uh, here in Scotland. 
That latter, the Manufacturing Action Plan, had some actions on us to uh, basically to deliver a series of events uh, to support the upskilling and the capacity building of the Scottish manufacturing sector by introducing uh, skills related to the circular economy, closed loop uh, reprocessing and remanufacturing. So this is where the series of lectures have come from. This is just part of that series of actions to really uh, get people engaged around the idea of the circular economy and manufacturing, uh, to think about business models, new business models, and to treat, reap some of those benefits going forward. So really tonight is, as I said, the start of that. Uh, and we're really pleased to welcome Mark uh, Dempsey from HP Inc. Uh, that's, the, that's the one, that's the standard joke for the evening. Uh, and this series will conclude uh, by looking at how former Nokia designer Tapani Jukin uh, is designing a modular mobile phone. Phone. I think that's just when I meant to do the other part. So these are the other lectures. Uh, so I would encourage you to sign up to them as well if you haven't already, because uh, there's a real range of this. And then they'll be uh, concluded later in 2018 with some specific masterclasses as well, as well as the lectures. Uh, to this is really to whet your appetite for some uh, more intensive masterclasses uh, around the themes that are going to be talked about uh, later in the year. The other thing that we do as Zero Waste Scotland is not just talk about uh, the circular economy, uh, we're also taking action to support individual companies here in Scotland. So we're already working with uh, over 60, around 80 companies in Scotland who have only sort of made a decision to to move to more circular design, uh, more circular business models, and we're working directly with them. We also have an investment uh, fund of about 18 million pounds, uh, which we are uh, facilitating investment in those companies and other companies to shift towards a more circular economy. Uh, we also have a number of other forums where people are coming, businesses are coming together to share uh, their opportunities and their, their thinking and also their ambition to become more circular so they can learn peer to peer. So there's a lot happening behind the scenes as well as uh, the sharing of information and bringing people like Mark uh, to Scotland to really share his knowledge and expertise. So anyway, I will now hand over to Mark, a little bit of an introduction if I may. Uh, as Mark has, uh, he is the UK Sustainability Manager for HP Inc. He's previously, worked, he's previously worked in Europe as the European Environmental Policy uh, Advisor for Hewlett Packard. He's worked in uh, Australia, Canberra. He's worked in uh, London, obviously, at Westminster. Uh, also uh, worked in Brussels, uh, all looking at not just sustainability, but the whole idea of the circular economy. So he's well, well, yeah, he is one of the uh, experts in this field in terms of the kind of thinking, but not just the thinking, but the doing. And that's really where the, this event comes in because he's going to talk about real life experience in a company uh, at HP who are reinventing the way its products are designed, manufactured, used and recovered and how you've shifted the business or you're beginning to shift that business model. Uh, so this is a real example of not just, the, you know, talking the talk, uh, but actually walking the walk. So welcome, Mark, and thank you very much for coming. Right, good evening everybody and thank you very much indeed for, for coming along this evening. It's great to see you all here. Thank you Ian for the introduction and um, uh, what I wanted to do really in the next, uh, I think I've got three quarters of an hour, is to talk to you about how we can take this idea of the circular economy from being a challenge into being an opportunity. So it's flipping that idea of the circular economy being something difficult and some of the forces behind it being a challenge into it being a business opportunity that businesses can take a lead on and get a competitive advantage of. So that's the journey that together we're going to go on over the next uh, few minutes. And I'm going to take you, hopefully, a little bit later on into the centre of the circular economy. And I'll take you on, to that, on that journey through the, through the circular economy. But before, before I do that, I've got some, uh, uh, some embarrassing photos to share with you. Because I thought I would just ch tell you a little bit about my journey. I can see some younger faces as well in the audience. And I guess about 20 years ago, I was kind of in a lecture theatre like this, thinking about waste and the environment, and what I might do in the future, and how I might forge a career in this particular space. 
Um, and this kind of shows, I suppose, a little bit of my journey. So, um, so I started off actually within the university. So there's a step before this, uh, and I worked at the University of Gloucestershire, working with businesses, um, small businesses mainly, on helping them to reduce waste and get an, uh, an advantage out of reducing waste, how to save money through waste. And it was the term that the um, uh, term at the time was waste minimization. Some people still talk in those terms, resource efficiency. But that was my first job. It was a great introduction to really show and crystallize how the environment and business can actually work together. Sometimes there's a, a, um, a tension between the two, but actually, if businesses get it right and think ahead, the business and the environment can very much work together and work to the advantage of business. So that was my first job. Then, when I had a little bit more hair, you can see there was a little bit more hair here, um, I, uh, I then moved to Westminster, and I headed up a, a group called the Parliamentary Sustainable Waste Group. So this was back in 2002, God, seems like a long time ago now. Um, and we were working with businesses and also politicians, MPs, lords, to try and forge new policies in order to try and create more, more sustainable practices in relation to waste. And so we were in the discussions around things like the landfill tax, which has really transformed the way in which waste is uh, handled in our country. The reason why we have all of these boxes that we uh, utilise to recycle our material is, is as a result of that particular initiative that took place. And we did a lot of work on the idea of producer responsibility, of making producers responsible for financing and recycling their waste when it when it becomes uh, a waste product um, and so yeah did a lot of work on that particular uh, on that particular side so I did did some work there then oh this is a real treat you get to see my legs isn't this exciting look everybody so um, so after three years in parliament I was uh, very lucky enough to get invited across to Australia to help the Australian government as they were developing their uh, policies on uh, producer responsibility and product stewardship. So I spent three months in Canberra working with them as part of um, a whole year of travels, which is very exciting. And then this gives you a little bit of a snapshot, snapshot into my current job. So uh, alongside talking about the circular economy, um, I also work as a sustainability manager for HP. What does that mean? That means kind of working in partnership with our customers and working internally within HP to make sure that we can embed sustainability into all the things that we do as a company and the things that we provide to our customers, which is really important. And alongside that, I also work part of my time in Brussels engaging with legislation that's coming from Brussels on waste. And there's uh, something called the Waste Framework Directive. And who's, who here has heard of the very, very sexy thing called the WE Directive. Anybody here heard of the WE Directive? You guys are the heroes. You're the best people. You guys have yet to come across this fantastic piece of legislation. So you've got this excitement yet to, to reach you, but there's a fantastic piece of legislation called the WE Directive, which I spend a lot of my time on. This is one of those bits of legislation uh, called Produce Responsibility, and it's about waste, electrical, and electronic equipment. And it means that manufacturers like HP have to finance and take care of electronic equipment when it becomes a waste. So it's a very sexy piece of legislation that I spend a lot of my time doing. So, um, so that this was me earlier on last year talking in the European Council to all of the member states about this, uh, this, this idea of the WE Directive. So that's what I do uh, some of my time. And then, well, I guess HP, sometimes we get mixed up with a very famous brown source manufacturer and I haven't made very much brown sauce in recent times but this kind of just gives you an illustration of what we do as a company um, so broadly speaking we make uh, PCs <laughs> laptops and printers um, so that's the that's our organization and just a couple of years ago we split from um, our uh, sister company which is now called Hewlett Packard Enterprise and they make like big servers and do all the data centers and all that kind of stuff so just to give you an illustration of what we're talking about and what HP is all about great and can everybody hear me am I coming across loud and clear I'm getting nods which is great okay so Let's start on this journey. What is the circular economy? So just to, get in a, to, to, to ask you guys a question, who, here, who is a, a circular economy virgin? Who, is this your first experience of hearing about the circular economy? Anybody here a circular economy? Okay, excellent. Well, I'm talking to, I'm talking to you in, the, in terms of this particular station. Who here 
works in the circular economy is almost a professor or an expert in the circular economy. This is your day-to-day -day job working in this particular area. Hands up if you're doing that. Okay. And then I guess the rest of you, you've heard about the circular economy and you want to hear more. Yeah. Okay. Great. So that's, that's why I'm going to hopefully pitch today's, uh, today's lecture. So for those that have never heard about the circular economy, this is for you. Um, and the essence of the circular economy really comes from our current way of making things. And our current uh, economy is really based upon a linear approach. We take stuff out of the ground, we make something with that, um, and then we use it, and then we tend to dispose of it. And that's been our model of production, really, since the Industrial Revolution. And it served us very well. We've, we've, we've worked through that model, and it's been responsible for the growth in our economy over the years. It's been a model that has worked very successfully. However, um, that particular way of doing things has started to come up against particular limitations. And this kind of this diagram gives you an illustration of, of some of those limitations. So this is the biggest man-made hole in the world. It's called Bingham Canyon Copper Mine, and it's a big hole. It's about two and a half miles across from one side to the other. It's nearly a mile deep. And I guess in very kind of visual terms, it illustrates the amount of stuff, the amount of material that we're taking from our planet every year in order to make all the things that we need to make uh, uh, to, to satisfy our economy, to give ourselves the goods and the, the, the things that we value in life. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that's coming out of our planet. But also what's interesting about this uh, particular mine is that when it first opened, the yield, the amount of material that you got out of the, the mine um, in order to, to the useful material, uh, was 4%. So 4% of the material you could utilise. But over the 100 years that it's been in operation, that yield has now gone down to 1%. So it kind of illustrates that our availability of natural resources is starting to decline. So we need to, to mine four times the amount of stuff in order to get the, the same amount of material than we did 100 years ago because the availability of natural resources has started to come up against limitations. On the other hand, our demand for those resources is increasing substantially. So the population of planet Earth is going up, but also, so the experts say, um, the number of middle-class consumers, the people that have got the ability to buy all the things that we buy and we're accustomed to buying, is set to go up by 3 billion by the year 2030. So we're putting a huge amount of more demand upon resources at the very time that the availability of those resources is starting to decline. So that model um, of take, make and dispose is starting to come up against limitations. And the experts say that in order to satisfy that demand for materials, that population growth, the number of middle class consumers, we're going to need something like 2.3 planet Earths. And I don't know about you, I think we're a very clever species, uh, the human race, but I don't think we've quite got the capacity yet to build another 1.3 planet Earth. So it's a big challenge for us. Um, and that's the reason why people have started to think about how we can do things differently and how we can perhaps re-engineer the way in which our economy functions from this take, make and dispose approach and instead adopt a circular approach so that materials flow almost in the same way as they do in nature where you think about nutrients circulating, a tree grows, dies, the nutrients then circulate so another tree can grow. And that's kind of the concept that lies behind the idea of a circular economy. There's an organisation that many of you might have heard of called the Ellen MacArthur Foundation which has been a particular proponent and a particular developer of this idea of a circular economy. There's a lot of materials that kind of explain the concept of the circular economy and, and videos that, um, that you can access through their, uh, through their website. So that's a little bit of a background as to what the circular economy is. Um, I just mentioned the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. This is one of the diagrams that that, that foundation has uh, produced. And so I expect you to memorise this diagram, and there'll be a test on it at the end of the lecture. But what it kind of illustrates, which I want to go into now, is that there are different sized circles within the circular economy. And the aim and objective 
in order to keep materials at the highest value they can be for the longest period of time is to get to the center of the circular economy, to get to those smaller loops. So we work from the outside of recycling, more towards the inside of reuse, uh, new business models so that we can lease products and also repair and, uh, and upgrade products. And we're moving towards the center of that particular model. So that's the Ellen MacArthur Foundation version. This is the HP version, so this is what we're going to talk about for the next few moments or two. And this just gives you an illustration of the business models and the products that HP have put in place in order that we can show leadership on the circular economy. So we're going to start from the outside of this particular diagram. We're going to start right at the outer layer, if you like, of the circular economy and talk a little bit about how we're recycling and reusing products. We're going to move in towards looking at how we're reusing and refurbishing our products. We're going to carry on that journey by looking at how we can change our business models and adopt products as a service and, and develop new, new approaches to the way in which we sell, our, sell and, and, and offer our products. And also how we can design our products to be upgraded and maintained. And then there's this mysterious item on the right-hand side, which I'll come back to a bit later, the bonus, the bonus topic, if you like. So that's what we're going to talk about, and we're going to start with recycling. So um, this is kind of the starting point, if you like, of the circular economy. And often people say it is just a starting point, and they're right. So recycling has a really important and valuable role to play as part of the circular economy, but it's that outer layer. But as HP, we take this really seriously. So we have our own recycling programmes across 73 different countries in order that we can recycle our hardware products and also that we can recycle our uh, printer cartridges and they can be returned to us as well. And this is a really important part of what we do. We recycle very large quantities of materials. But also th thinking about this from a business point of view, this is something that we offer our business customers. And I'm often stood in front of audiences like this of business customers and it differentiates HP to be able to say to our business customers, we can recycle your products free of charge. And they look, to, look at us and think, wow, really? Can you? Honestly? And we say, yes, we can help you to do that. Um, and it takes that weight off our business customer's shoulders, but it also means that in partnership, we can recycle those products and give our business customers and make our business customers the sustainability hero, the sustainability success story. So it's a really important part of making sure that we recycle our products and do the right thing in relation to the environment. But it's also an opportunity for HP to show our customers that we're doing the right thing and also make them the sustainability success story. And in that way, it's a great business opportunity for HP. So recycling a really important first step in terms of our journey on the circular economy. The second step is then ensuring that those materials then go back into the manufacture of new products. And this approach is called, is called closed loop recycling. So you can see on the uh, right hand side of this particular slide what we do. So we take uh, old print cartridges and then uh, we do something very clever, which is called mashing them up. It's a very technical term, um, in order that we can create a recycled plastic resin. Um, that recycled plastic resin is then added together with recycled resin that originates from water bottles and also from coat hangers. And that is then used to manufacture new print cartridges with that material. So in that way, we're closing the loop. And in this era of uh, real concern about plastics waste and ocean plastics, this is helping to divert significant amounts of plastics that would otherwise go to landfill and potentially could, uh, could uh, end up in the oceans. So we've done this. And we've now done this for a huge amount of, of products. So I think 3.4 billion print cartridges have now been manufactured using this particular technology um, and it's managed to divert gosh I think I think something in excess of three billion water bottles now so huge amounts of progress that we've made in this particular area the environmental advantage of this is significant because using a recycled plastic rather than using virgin plastic has a lower carbon footprint 
has a lower fossil fuel consumption. So there are real benefits for the environment from driving this particular, this particular um, uh, approach. Uh, and it's shown real leadership in relation to our plans to, to, uh, to lead on the circular economy. So a really great approach. And we've transferred this knowledge of how we can close the loop, how we can use recycled plastics in the manufacture of our products across from our supplies to our hardware. So we're now using recycled plastics in our printers, in our PCs, in our displays of different quantities. And there is a challenge because there are technical limitations sometimes in terms of the, the ability to use recycled plastics but we're continuing to work in order to get this, this material into our products. So um, earlier on this year, I was in Brazil, and there's a fantastic example of HP working in Brazil. So on one side of the road, we have our manufacturing facility, and on the other side of the road, we have our recycling facility. And we take back printers and laptops into our recycling facility. We disassemble them. We then recycle the material... And then we then use that recycled material across the road in our manufacturing facility to make new products. So it's a really great, tangible way. You can see the, the, the circular economy in practice at one of our manufacturing facilities. So a really great example of the work that we do. And then I also wanted to tell you a little bit about how we're using that to kind of outreach to the communities in which we serve. So one of the projects that we've been involved with is in Haiti. And you'll know that there have been particular problems in Haiti because of the, uh, the earthquake that was there and the plastic bottles that have then needed to be used in order to provide fresh water to the community there. And so, um, and so in Haiti, we've got involved in uh, trying to utilise those plastic bottles and invest at the same time in the, community, uh, the, in the community in Haiti in order that we can provide education and healthcare to the local community and also drive the economy by taking the, the plastic water bottles and utilising those to then manufacture new printer cartridges. And hopefully this technology is going to work um, and I can show you a quick video of the work that we're doing there. Oh, is it going to work? <laughs> C'est pays mnié. Pendant après 12 janvier, nous venons vivre en battante. Et ma vie personne, c'est mon cap. Continue, c'est mon maman, c'est mon papa. A vous même pour moi, c'est à bon nom, et puis au cas où j'ai pire devant. Plus mouvement, plus mouvement, plus passer ça pour nous capables de nettoyer le pays avec Pogina en avant la CIA. Moi, je joins tous les petits amis qui viennent nous aimer. C'est là dans nos pays l'école, c'est là dans nos pays caï, c'est là dans niveau et tout le l'école, c'est là dans nos fait toute bagarre net. Nous allons changer dans la vie. Moi, je viens entrer dans sa bouteille qui fait nous devenir pays, nos pays caï, pays caï. Ok, après ça, même dans la plastique là, et puis nous venons continuer, moi, mettre tout le monde l'école et puis nous continuer avec. Je ne sais pas si c'est bon, je ne sais pas si c'est bon. Je ne sais pas si c'est ça qui fait, je suis intéressé. 
So I think that's a really good kind of illustration of actually how the circular economy can marry three different things. It can marry our need to uh, address sustainability, our business interests and our ability to make a business case for, for, for the circular economy, and also how we can use it to outreach to the community and make a difference in the community. And I think that that's a, a great example, I think, of how the circular economy is enabling us to do that. So we've started on this journey to the centre of the circular economy, and we've looked a little bit about how we utilise recycling, um, how we can benefit our uh, our business customers through recycling and also how we're utilising materials in order to manufacture new products. But I guess the next step on that journey is then into uh, reuse. And um, I guess not far from here, in Erskine, which is only just down the road from here, isn't it? So the picture on the right is actually our facility in Erskine. And at that facility, we take back uh, products that need to be repaired, products that have been sent back by customers for repair and also products that, that have previously been leased and we reuse those products. So there's a process that, that we have in place in order to test those products, to repair those products if they need to be repaired and then to send them back out to customers so they can have a second life. And we've done that uh, with huge volumes of products. It's a great, a, a great biz, uh, uh, business that we operate, but it also enables us to extend the life of our products and ensure that our products have a, a second life. And you can see that we managed to hit very high reuse rates through the use of that facility. 82% uh, uh, reuse rates, 18% recycling rates. And again, it enables us to talk about this story to our customers. So it's our customers' products that are coming back through this particular facility. And so we can share that success with our customers and help, again, to show that our customers are the, the, the success story. So it's a great way that we can be proud as HP of this reuse activity, but also we can build partnerships with our customers and even tell our customers how much reuse of, of their products we're making and how that's benefiting the environment. So, uh, a great, a gr again, a great opportunity for us to build businesses. This gives you a bit of a, a step through of that of uh, the facility. It's, I mean, it's a modern manufacturing, but effectively remanufacturing facility and a reverse logistics facility. So, products come into the the the, uh, the facility there. Um, they're tested. Data is wiped. Um, then, if necessary, there is uh, the ability to repair and remanufacture products within the plant, and then they go back out. It's a very organised facility because obviously customers want to, to, to ensure that their products have been properly data sanitised and are going out to the right uh, in the right way. But then the products are then remarketed and sold again to, for a second use. So it's it's a great example of how we are able to reuse reuse uh, products and ensure that products have a second life. So. We talked a little bit about recycling and we've talked a little bit about reuse. But what next? What else can we do as HP in order to lead on this transition towards uh, the circular economy? So the next step is thinking about new business models. Um, and I guess we're all now kind of accustomed uh, to the way in which our economy is changing. We're using Airbnb or Uber. Uh, many different uh, items of our economy now are about sharing, about leasing products. Back in, back when I was a kid, um, we had something called radio rentals. Who here remembers or has heard of radio rentals? Anybody here? So, great. Kind of the older people in the audience, which is kind of... So I'll, we'll, we'll hold our hands up. Not, not... Yeah. So, sorry, sorry. But, um, but it, I guess back in the day... The, the renting and the leasing of products were seen as almost a little bit old-fashioned. And I think now we're in an era, actually, where the renting and the leasing and the sharing of products is very much now cutting edge. It's the way in which our economy is transforming in order to, in order to maximise our use of those assets. And, we're, and there's a huge business opportunity as a result of this. And we're seeing that, too, as HP within, a, within the IT space. So... We have for some time offered our customers the opportunity of managing their print services. So rather than customers buying our printers and buying our photocopiers and having that asset to manage themselves and having to buy that material, buy those products and put that on their balance sheet, 
Instead, it's something that we can lease to those, uh, to those customers. And by leasing that product to our customers, we can take it back at end of life. We can maintain it so that, that, uh, that the product is serviced and maintained and lasts longer. And we can also manage the energy efficiency of the product so that, it's the, that we reduce the energy consumption of the product through its lifetime. And by doing that, we can achieve some very, very significant results for our customers. And we're now seeing more and more customers take this opportunity of leasing their products rather than buying their products. And as a result of that, we're able to, again, share information with those customers about the amount of energy that they've saved, what's happened to their products when the, their products have reached the end of, uh, their end of life. So again, we can give, that, give our customers that sus sustainability information and make them the, su the sustainability success story. So we're doing that in the printing space, we're also doing that in the personal system space. Uh, and we see now this idea of moving towards device as a service, as a real business opportunity for HP. And also, I think, from a business perspective, not just an opportunity in relation to the circular economy and helping our customers to achieve their sustainability ends, but also an opportunity, a business opportunity, to, to maintain strong relationships with our customers. If they're leasing products, then it's more likely that we're going to retain those customers over a longer period of time. So there's a huge business opportunity and business interest in it for, from HP's point of view. So we do that very much in the business space. But now there's something very exciting that we've been, been uh, doing, which is, and I brought a little prop with me. So we've, we've transferred that particular approach of renting and leasing products across now to the household space. Hands up here, who has run out of ink at a critical moment in their lives? Who has had that, that moment where you have a little perspiration on your brow as you go to hit the print button with maybe a report that you have to publish or an essay that has to be handed in or whatever it might be, and the printer says, I'm really sorry, you've run out of ink and you think, can I dash down to the supermarket before it closes? Can I get down there and still make it to the meeting in time? We have this moment of panic, don't we, where we sometimes hit the print button and it's run out of ink. Well, the idea of instant ink... Oh, gosh, I've, I've uh, moved on. Uh, the idea of instant ink is that you never get that panicky moment. So instead you effectively rent the ink. The, the printer talks to HP, and when you get near to that moment of, per, of, of perspiration, a new printer cartridge comes through the post in the box that I've just illustrated, and in that box, and I'll hand it round so you can have a look, in that box is a cartridge and also in an envelope, um, and so you can return the old printer cartridge to us, and it comes back for recycling. Um, and, um, and you get a you know, new print cartridge uh, in, the, in the pack, so you never get that moment of, of panic ever again. So it's a really great way that we're able to um, effectively rent ink to you. We're effectively able to rent this service to you, and by that way we were able to close the loop because we can get those print cartridges and manufacture new print cartridges with them. We get much better return rates through this particular approach, um, and it's a new way in which we can supply our products. So... Instant ink, is, I think, is a great way that we can start to move in the household space into a new business model of renting products rather than selling products. So, um, uh, and, and inst incidentally, anybody here an instant ink customer? Anybody here part of this service yet? Nobody. Oh, wow. Okay. One person. Excellent. Good. Okay. Next time I come, all the hands will go up. You'll all be dashing home and, and pressing the instant ink button when I, when I come back next time. Great. So we've gone on, that, on this journey from recycling at the edge towards how can we reuse products, um, how can we build new business models so that we can get our products back, and what are the advantages for HP as a result of that. And we're now nearing the centre of the circular economy. How can we upgrade products? How can we maintain products? and design our products so that they can last even longer. And this is something that HP is very much focused upon. We've had actually designed for environment programs uh, since 1992, so for a very long time. Um, and this slide behind me, which is, is quite interesting. So this time last year, I was speaking at uh, a conference, and, um, and I put this slide up, 
And uh, I was speaking with friends of the European Commission, and I said, it's great, HP are doing a great job in terms of design for environment. Um, and our X2, which is a product up here, has won 10 out of 10 by an organization called iFixit because it's easily repairable. And you can see here that it comes apart. There are, um, uh, there are unified screws. It's easy to take apart. You can take the battery out and you can repair it. It's a really, really great story. And so I sat down and, and thought, great. And then I looked at the program and I realized that iFixit themselves were next on the agenda of the conference. I thought, oh my gosh. I really hope they're going to say nice things about us. I hope I haven't, I haven't kind of uh, said the wrong thing. And it was wonderful, actually, because I, they were on a video link, and I fix it, uh, started speaking, and they, um, they got two products out. So they got our product, the X2, out, and then they got one of our competitors' products out. And I won't tell you who, who it was, but it was one of the products that blows up when you're on, um, on aeroplanes. So you can imagine, you can imagine which uh, producer I'm thinking of. And they said, this is, so they pointed to our competitor's product, and they said, this is exactly what you shouldn't be doing. You can't take it apart, you can't take the battery out, everything's glued in, there are no repair instructions, this is exactly what you shouldn't be doing. And then they took our X2, and they said, this is exactly what producers should be doing, because it comes apart, it can be repaired, you can take the battery out, you can repair different components. And I thought, oh, thank goodness for that, thank goodness they've said nice things about us. So I think this shows the possibilities. This shows what we can do and what we are doing in order to design our products so that they're easily repaired, so that they can uh, last longer um, and therefore satisfy the objectives of the circular economy. And as I said, I fix it, said good things about us, so it's great. Um, but we're not just doing that in terms of repair, but we're also making our products smaller and lighter. If you think of how... Um, when, I, when I, my first kind of desktop computer was probably about this big and this high and stood on the desk, now you look at your desktop computers and they're much, much smaller. They can sit behind your computer. And we've now got this, the slice, which is 70% lighter than the equivalent uh, desktop product. So we're making our product smaller, using less materials. It's part of our drive towards re resource efficiency. So really important stuff. Um, and I was also really relieved when I was speaking at another conference because I was able to show the European Commission the kind of work that we're doing in order to enable repair. So there's a lot of push at the moment by policymakers to encourage producers to enable other people to repair their products. And I was able to stand up and show them that this is something that HP is already doing. So we already have disassembly instructions online. We have repair instructions online. We also have access to spare parts online, and we're already doing it. It's a great way that we can enable other people to be able to repair uh, and, and utilise our product. So, great stuff. So, we're on that journey. We've, we've nearly reached the, the centre of the circular economy. But there's one final bonus component that I want to share with you. Maybe a look at the future of where maybe the circular economy and also where production might go in the future. And that's this yellow box on the right. What is the yellow box on the right? Well, the yellow box on the right is the opportunity of 3D technology and 3D printing to change the way in which we make our products and by doing so, enable us to achieve a circular economy. How can we do that? Well, if you think of 3D printing and what that might enable us to do, it might enable us to manufacture smaller runs of products so that uh, we don't have to consume vast quantities of products to make a run of products. It might enable us to manufacture small components so that we can make products uh, repairable. It might enable us to change the properties of, of, a, of a product so that it can last longer. There are many ways in which 3D printing could change the, the way in which we make our products. And I'm going to perhaps illustrate some possibilities for you. And, and this is very much at the early stages. So as HP, we are we're developing this technology. And I think as a society, we're also developing how we might utilise this technology. But I'm going to just pr propose some ways in which 3D printing might enable a circular economy. And I'm going to do it through the lens of my colleague, Kirsty, who's very accident-prone, um, and tends to lose and break things a lot. So this is uh, Kirsty's car, and she managed to break the coffee holder in her car. So she looked uh, and studied exactly what would happen, 
And she realised that if she wanted a new coffee holder to repair the one that she'd broken, then the product was going to be manufactured in China. It was then going to be transported via New Zealand, across the sea, all the way to the United Kingdom. Huge journey, I guess huge carbon miles as a result of that, and a massive, uh, I guess a, a fairly significant impact on the environment. Now let's just imagine that instead of needing that product to be manufactured in China, instead there was a 3D printer somewhere near her home in Henley. Instead, the product still be designed uh, and optimised in New Zealand, where the intellectual property resided, but instead of the part be having to be transported halfway across the planet, it could instead, a file be transfer, transferred halfway across the planet, but the product actually manufactured and made close to her home in Henley-on-Thames, eliminating all of that need for transport and, and the, the, the associated impacts as a result of that. So very different model in the way in which we might be able to make our products. So that's one perhaps example. I said she was accident prone. She also managed to uh, break, and she's got one of these very clever uh, vacuum cleaners. She managed to break her vacuum cleaner and she realised that the supplier of that vacuum cleaner no longer keeps spare parts in order for her to be able to repair that vacuum cleaner. And she also realised that, um, that in order to repair the cooker knob on her cooker, the organisation eSpares has to keep uh, nearly 10,000 different types of cooker knob in case somebody needs to repair their cooker knob. You think of all of the materials that are... Uh, that are bound up in warehouses across our country and across our world in case somebody needs a cooker knob to repair their cooker. We've got vast quantities of natural resources that are just locked up in warehouses across our, across our uh, world in order to enable repair. So huge amounts of materials that maybe we could eliminate if we could uh, print that instead of, of having to manufacture it. I mentioned that she was uh, clumsy, so she managed to break the, the latch on a washing machine. She looked online and she realised that the cost of repairing that latch would be nearly 60, 60, 70 pounds, six, nearly 68 pounds. Would you, who would repair their, the latch on their washing machine for 68 pounds? I think it's going to be quite a disincentive for many people. So imagine maybe it with 3D printing where we can make that product at a much, much lower cost and therefore promote repair. And similarly, for uh, the, the handle on her, I think it's on, the wash, on, on, her, um, uh, on her washing machine, uh, the cost is actually lower in this particular case, but the wait for that product is nearly six weeks. So you think of the high cost or the long wait to get that product, how we might be able to promote reuse and repairability if we can make products easier, quicker, and cheaper to repair through, uh, through 3D technology. So I think there's a huge opportunity there, and I think this is kind of almost an add-on to the circular economy in order that we can promote those particular, uh, those particular ideas. Um, I'm just going to finish off, if I may, with a, a quick video which kind of summarises some of the things that we've been talking to today, and then I'll just draw a couple of lessons, if I can, but I think this is quite a good video to finish on. The conventional on. lifespan of most products is linear. There's a clear beginning and a clear end. Once they've served their purpose, they're often discarded, forgotten, and left behind. But HP takes a different approach, one that focuses on reuse, reinvention, and reintroduction. Not life spans, life cycles. From the very beginning, our products and services are designed and built to impact lives in unique ways. Once they've served their purpose, they can start a new cycle, Instead of ending up in landfills, they can be put back into the hands of the very people they were designed to inspire. It's the type of global change we've been committed to leading for over 50 years. From customers and employees to partners and people across the globe, we continue to be driven by one simple idea, a better world for all of us. Whether it's proven methods or new innovations, every product has a purpose. Every service has meaning, and every decision matters. Not just to us, but to everyone, everywhere. Because we believe we're responsible for everything we put into this world, ensuring it all comes full circle.
So that kind of uh, is a good, I think, overall summary of the progress that we're making. And uh, during the co course of the last few minutes, I think we've talked uh, about the different ways in which we can bring to life the circular economy and how we can turn that challenge that we talked about at the start into a business opportunity through recycling our products and making our customers the sustainability hero, from introducing new business models that can give HP the competitive advantage, and through new breakthrough technologies like 3D printing that can really help to transfer, transform our economy. So there's lots of work. It's a journey that I think we continue to be on as a company, and we'll continue to develop this idea. But I think that kind of the, the, the final word there is exactly what the circular economy provides HP, which is the opportunity to, to take on that challenge and to keep reinventing. So thank you very much indeed for, for your attention. It's been a pleasure to be here. And I think we've got now some time for some questions. So I'll pass back to Ian. I've been thinking as I've been listening to, uh, to the sessions. Um, and I guess this is initially uh, addressed to, to, to Mark Dempsey. Um, Mark, obviously, it's a real compelling story to, to hear what, what HP Inc. Are, are currently doing in this space, the different business models, and clearly there's, there's, a, there's a business case behind this. But as I think about um, the, the broader manufacturing sector, subsectors, the SME community, the, this is a really quite a challenging agenda for, for businesses to, to get their head around, and, and part of the, 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 the challenge is communicating this to the different, to different businesses and getting businesses to do something different from, from their day job, from the business as usual. What would, what would your advice be um, in terms of how, how best to communicate that from, from a business case perspective? Well, that's a good question. I think that actually uh, SMEs it's, it's sometimes have an advantage because they can move more quickly. Um, a large organisation can sometimes um, uh, sometimes move more slowly than the SME. Actually, HP, we, when we split into two companies, we saw it as an opportunity of us almost becoming a little bit like a startup company because we were splitting into two new companies. And I think it's given us the opportunity of moving more quickly in this space. Um, but I think that uh, for an SME uh, and somebody that's coming to this new, I would say make a start. And we've kind of taken... Uh, taking you guys on a journey today and I guess that you know making a start in terms of, re uh, of, of recycling your products I think is a good way to, to start but also look at those other opportunities that we've talked about today because there are opportunities of, of, of standing out from your competition I think through the circular economy uh, of new business models that can enable you to get your products back um, and make your products longer lasting uh, designing your products so that they can be disassembled. I think there are, there are, there are ways in, in which the circular economy provides the opportunity for businesses to stand out and get competitive advantage. And I think that message applies as much as it does to a big company like HP as it does to an SME. Thank you. Uh, any other thoughts on, 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 on that in terms of how we, we communicate this? Ian, I, I imagine you, you have something to, to say on this in terms of how we get the message out to, to, to the wider manufacturing sector. I was going to follow on that just slightly because I, th I think there is a, uh, I think one of the challenges we've appreciated in, here in Scotland working with businesses, and particularly SMEs, that some, some see it as a kind of, as an entrepreneur thing, you know, it's, we're startup companies, it's kind of easy to say, all oh, right, circular economy, and that's the thing, let's get into it. But some of the more traditional companies, you know, they're all, I mean, at SME level, they think, well, what's wrong with our model? Well, it's ticking over fine. I'm not saying they're short term, but it's all more of a challenge for them to see some of those mega trends, you know, because you're a global company, you see that possibly that's, that's that you see that very uh, real to you. I think that's one of the challenges, I think, how do you get into some of the more traditional companies who potentially are going to struggle because of their traditional companies and the raw materials and the cost and the accessibility of the raw materials. So I don't know if that's something that, you know, you can help with as a bigger company to try and help some of those medium term medium-sized companies, which are clearly part of your supply chain. Yeah, I, I, can, I can see what you're saying, and, and um, you know, kind of reflecting, I guess, back on when I, when I you know, the, the, the kind of journey that I've been on in my career, that's always been a challenge, I think, because SMEs, right, you know, rightly so, their first concern is, can we pay the, the bills at the end of the month? Can we pay the, the, the salaries at the end of the month? But I think that um, 
I think that the circular economy, as I said, does give, give a business opportunity rather than people seeing it as I've got to do this because it's good for the environment or because uh, the government say that I should do or whatever. Actually, the circular economy gives, gives businesses a positive financial benefit potentially from going down this, this route. And I think that's the, the, the opportunity that is there for businesses. And I think the other thing is that, uh, that, um, that in the long term, you know, if this trend of, of increasing costs of natural resources um, continues, then it's something that is it's important that businesses are able to get more of their materials back and utilise those, those, those materials as, 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 as input into their, into their production. So I think, you know, whatever size the business is, there's an imperative there to take this, this issue seriously. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add add to that in that um, I think from the SME perspective we, we work as well as with Zero Waste Scotland as a consultancy we work with uh, Scottish enterprise businesses as well and, and qu quite often the ones that are most receptive uh, to these sorts of new ideas are actually the SMEs they're the new startup companies quite often actually who want to do things differently and see a, a business opportunity in in doing that and often the the more traditional engineering companies the more traditional manufacturing companies are, are more reluctant um, whilst they're still profitable. And I think what we've always found with resource efficiency and now circular economy is that businesses only tend to look at new business models when their profitability starts to decline. And that may be too late, you know, and the, the better businesses that we work with um, have got that forward, uh, forward look and they're more proactive in thinking about how they maintain profitability and indeed you know, work more closely with customers, satisfy customer need, think about how the new technology can enable new business models, um, 3D printing and, and the internet of things and the tracking of, of product condition, all these sorts of things we're going to cover in some of the other lectures uh, that Ian, Ian mentioned uh, that we'll be running later, uh, later on. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's, it's a huge business opportunity really for, for many businesses, often Scottish manufacturing businesses uh, producing very high quality, highly engineered products. And if you put those products out onto the market and then they then uh, are sold on into second and third and fourth lives in the market without your involvement, then you've lost the value that you designed and engineered into the product in the first place. And uh, why not recover that value uh, and make the most of what you've designed into the product? Um, and that's really what circular economy is about in the, in the business sense. Um, question for me? Right. Yes, I will. So, um, uh, Elsa Joao, University of Strathclyde. I, I'm interested in the reporting. So, we have uh, CR reports and we have sustainability reports, and obviously we have the financial reporting. But I wonder where the circular economy reporting will come. I mean, will it be part of a sustainability report, or will we create a new, completely new? Uh, reporting on circular economy because obviously it's important in terms of us knowing the performance of different companies and learning from them and comparing them. So where would that data be? Because some of the data would be quite unique to the circular economy. There is not just obviously about waste minimisation, etc. So I was just wondering where you, what's your views? Yeah. So so from HP's perspective, we provide a annual sustainability report to all of our stakeholders. And in that, there's a huge amount of information about how we are leading on the circular economy from our recycling rates to the amount of uh, recycled material that's going into our products. And we also, you know, I showed you some of the stuff that we put online. In addition to that, we also put up online the recycled content that's within our printer cartridges so that we can tell our customers, if you buy this particular printer cartridge, this is, this is the amount of recycled content within those printer cartridges. So that's kind of one level of reporting. Then there are particular reports that we can provide for our customers, to, uh, and I mentioned about how we're making our customers a sustainability success story. We're doing that for individual customers and providing them with, uh, with um, tailored sustainability reports so that we can show them how much we've, our customers, how much we've recycled for them, how much of their products we've reused, and the environmental benefits of that. And then, of course, we do a lot of reporting for indices like the Gartner Index and the Carbon Disclosure Programme, and I think we're on the A-list for, 
for those kind of, we're in the top 25 of the Gartner Index and the A-list of the Carbon Disclosure Programme because these are really important uh, indices for us. So I think there's a, a lot of, 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 of well, I think one of the, the, um, the strengths that HP has, has had and continues to have as a company is its transparency in reporting to our stakeholders on the performance that we have on sustainability as a whole and specifically on the circular economy. Um, just to say that I think more widely beyond the individual companies there is a little bit of a problem in that we've relied almost entirely on waste statistics and the circular economy is about preventing this stuff becoming waste and so it doesn't go through the normal uh, channels it goes you know through either direct reuse or preparing for reuse into into other uh, other channels and so uh, I know the European Commission and Eurostat and people have been having to think quite hard about how we actually understand the degree of circularity that's happening uh, in the economy. You know, if all of this stuff is kind of happening uh, invisibly, if, if you like, and uh, the sharing economy and, and, uh, and reuse is often very difficult to, to track. So, uh, yeah, it'll re rely on, on reporting from individual companies, and particularly some of these bigger companies to, to get a handle on just how much of this, this is actually happening. Can I just add, add to that? I think, I think um, Mark makes a very good point. And policy sometimes, um, for good reasons, sets, sets targets which, which don't necessarily reflect, as, as Mark was saying, the reality of what's happening in the, in the economy. So um, I mentioned this really sexy bit of legislation earlier on called the WE Directive. And um, this directive sets targets for uh, countries to achieve collection rates of 65%. So 65% of the material put on the market, they should go and collect and make sure that it's recycled. Sounds really good. But actually, the point that Mark made is, is vitally important because in a world where we are reusing more products and perhaps products are exported for reuse to different countries, that data needs to be measured. Um, and we now see that more and more... Uh, waste, because it has a value, is either recycled or reused by organisations other than producers, for good reason, but isn't being captured in the data. So we're not going to maybe we, will, we won't meet those 65% targets unless we have a much more sophisticated data capture system. And it's something that we've been arguing for as a really good news story, because the UK has taken this seriously and has adopted this approach, that all of the different material flows have to be measured in order to reflect whether we're going to meet these 65% targets. Um, and that will help to, to, to enable us to, um, to report on the fact that the circular economy is happening in practice and also means that we don't end up actually pushing more material into recycling rather than reuse just to meet a 65% collection target. So legislation needs to understand the sophistication of waste material flows that is already happening in the, in the economy um, of a circular nature in order, uh, in order to achieve the, the right targets. Just, I, it is a big challenge, I know that, as, as Mark said, about trying to measure the circularity of either a product or a service and all that, you know. But then the other side, you could say as well, maybe the, the, the motif that should be on the product is how wasteful is this product? So start with just getting the companies to prove that this is not a wasteful product. So it's kind of like, you know, arguing that that's you know, the measure is cause if, if you had to put your products on the shelf that said this is a 50 percent wasteful product, you'd probably do more about it, you know, because nobody would want that. Everybody would want to try and get to the, the less wasteful product. So it's trying to tease that out of how do, what do we actually measure? Because there is going to be a huge uh, array of business looking at how do you measure uh, the circularity of products and then arguing about how circle that is and what part of the circle do you get in it? Is it the inner circle, the outer circle, as you've just said there? Do we just, it might be easier just to do recycling rather than the maintenance stuff. So it's trying to think of it from a different point of view. Sorry. Cool. Um, so are there any regulations in place to um, like guarantee that reused products are have like a good quality so if i buy a new one and i know okay i've got a two-year guarantee but if i buy a reused one and i would have like one year guarantee or like what does it, what does it work? 
That's a really, really good question. And there, I think they're emerging a, a set of, of policies to try and push towards more reuse and to enable the circular economy. So, for example, um, at the moment in Europe, there's, there are whole discussions around the circular economy and there have been policies called the circular economy package governing um, the design of products and also governing what happens when they become a, a waste. And so I've been quite involved in that. Just to give you an insight into one part of that, um, the, uh, they want to change, so as part of this package, they want to change the way in which we pay for uh, the recycling of our products and to uh, give, in, guess, give us incentives so that those fees are higher if our products are more difficult to repair or more difficult to reuse or more difficult to recycle and lower if our products are easier to repair and easier to reuse and easier to recycle. Um, and that's just one of the, the ideas that's come forward at the moment. We've been uh, working with the European policymakers on that idea so that it has a sufficient scale of incentive to make it real. Um, and, uh, but the, there's a whole array of ideas at the moment from policymakers in Europe as part of this circular economy package to promote the reuse of products and to try and enable and reward manufacturers that are designing their products for reuse and repairability. Yeah, just to uh, just to add to that, a couple of a couple of points. Firstly, um, when we talk about remanufactured products, they are built to the same or better standards than a new product, and so you would get the same warranty with a remanufactured product. Often, remanufactured products are business to business sort of products rather than consumer products, but increasingly that you know that may may change. But I think your point uh, about um, understanding the durability of, of products and how consumers can understand that is really an important one because you know you go into into curries or, or whatever and look at washing machines or whatever it might be and it's very difficult to know what you're getting for your money in terms of durability repairability reliability um, and organizations like which you know the consumers association uh, do lots of testing to to give some indication for for which uh, members of, of that, but I strongly believe that we need to do a lot more to to label uh, for for products, uh, you know, to, to give consumers clarity around around what they're getting in terms of some of these things, um, and that would I think help to drive, you know, improved design of of products because we're we're in a kind of race to the bottom really with uh, with a lot of product uh, categories in that we're just going for cheaper and cheaper products. You know, it's it's stuff is getting shorter lived. Um, you know, TVs used to last 10, 15 years and now they may, you know, last five years or whatever and the technology is changing all the time. So the type of work that HP does on, on upgradability and, and repairability and so on is, is really important, but uh, HP is quite unusual in that. And, and we need, I, th I need, I think, um, regulatory drivers and, uh, and other things to help uh, incentivize other manufacturers to do the same. Yeah, I think a, a fair, fair point, you know, we, we did some work um, because we were looking at this from a waste point of view and the average age of HP products that come back in the waste stream tends to be about nine or ten years and what happens in, in, in householders um, is that people tend to use our products for maybe three or four years then they might pass them on within the family. We all do this, don't we? We give it to give it to dad or give it to mum or um, uh, or gran or gramp, and and the the product might have a second life. And then sometimes it gets put in a cupboard for a couple of years, and then by the time you know maybe you have a clear out, by the time it becomes a waste, it tends to be about nine or ten years old, and that's the average age of the HP products that we see coming back as a as a waste, which presents a challenge because. Uh, often policymakers are, are, are saying, well, we should have targets on waste to say that that waste should be reused. And the challenge, of course, is that once it's become nine or ten years old, it's unlikely that anybody in this room will, will, would want a nine or ten year old laptop because technology has moved forward. And it's also very difficult to measure those reuse cycles within a family or through eBay or, or whatever it is. So... Sometimes legislation has good intentions, but needs to really be worked through very practically in order for it to have the right incentives in place and to recognise the reality that actually a lot of reuse is happening. It's just happening in, in places that aren't measurable. 
Um, so, for example, on the, on the business side, huge amounts of products are reused by big asset management companies. So imagine when this university wants to get rid of its IT fleet. It's not going to put it in a skip. It's going to phone up an asset management company. That asset management company is going to come forward normally with a check to say, yep, yeah, we'll take all of your uh, computers and laptops and so forth. Here's the check that we're going to give you for it. And then that asset management company will then decide which products are reusable, will sell them for, for, uh, for onward, onward use. All of that happens without any of that becoming a waste and without any of that data being reported to any, any particular authority. So again, it's, it's, it's a very important part of the circular economy that is fun functioning very successfully that isn't currently measured if, if we're setting targets in that particular area. So we need to understand the reality of some of those flows. Just, uh, sorry, do you want to address that yet? Is, can I ask Mark a question? Can I just jump in? Sure, yeah. Because so, yep. so, so, uh, it's just following on from that. I mean, I guess one of the, uh, I was uh, lucky enough to speak at a, an event in uh, China a year and a bit ago, and, and one of the conversations we had there, obviously, and I think you alluded to it in your slide, is that obviously the growth in the population uh, in, across the world, but also not just the numbers, but the, the shift into the kind of middle class, so to speak. Uh, and also that is very acute uh, in, in Asia, uh, in China and other things. And we got, you know, the whole argument there is over the next uh, 10, 15 years, something like 400 million people are going to move into middle class and they'll all want uh, an air conditioning unit and a washing machine, etc. And they'll all want a laptop and something like that. So I get that the circular economy kind of works, the thinking always works with a kind of finite market, I guess. But when you suddenly have to go, I mean, basically the, the, the guy in China was saying, he still needs the metal to make all of those units. He gets the leasing model and he gets the repairability. But somebody's actually got to physically make those things. So I guess I'm interested, I'm not saying that you're going to, obviously, well, you probably want to sell 400 million computers in China. But I guess they are, it's from an HP point of view, from a global company, what, it goes back to your point about resources. I mean, that, that must be a massive challenge going forward. Where are the actual resources going to come from? Although I am taking a little, uh, I am encouraged by your 900,000 doorknob, uh, cooker knobs. Is that the resources of the future? Because I, I mean, I'm really interested. How, how do you scale up if the resources are still going to be finite? I, I think that question is at the heart of the circular economy, and it's the, it's the reason why Europe, I think, has taken the circular economy so seriously because I think they foresee, European policymakers foresee that in the future, um, Europe will be, in, all, in order to continue for Europe to grow and for Europe to be a centre for manufacturing, Europe is going to need to secure resources. And, um, and that, I think, is, is, a, is a huge challenge. So I think it's the, you know, it's, it's the case for, for any manufacturer is that, is, is that the circular economy provides a security for those resources going forward. It provides security for Europe, it provides security for manufacturers like HP that we can, um, and this is you know, really the argument that, that lies behind the circular economy, that we can secure those resources and we can also secure some stability in resource prices uh, going forward. So yeah, that's, that's the reason really why people uh, see the circular economy as an opportunity so that, you know, that, so that, we're, that the instability that could occur in raw material prices is ameliorated by being able to rely on recycled materials and get more materials back. But it's going to require that transformation. It's going to require things like the, the business models that we've talked about today and being able to get more, material, more of your uh, products back in order for it to happen. And I think we're really at the start of that transition. Some companies have taken it further than others, but in order that we can meet the, re the requirements that we've just, you know, just talked about in, in relation to populations and population growth in the middle classes, it's, I think, going to, going to increasingly become, become the challenge that we have to face, but also, as we've shown here, the opportunity that it provides to businesses to, to make that transition. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got, probably got time for one, one more sort of final question before we, um, we close for refreshments. 
Uh, sorry, <coughs> I've got a frog in my throat. Thank you very much for the, the detailed information about HP. It's been enlightening, so thanks very much. Um, I think the, I've got a couple of part questions as related to the comments and questions and uh, feedback as we've been going. But firstly, my name is Karina, um, uh, and I own a startup company called Kittywig. Um, and as a startup, um, it's always encouraging to see how bigger businesses develop their business models, as that's what we're here to talk about today. But I'm curious, um, as an entrepreneur, how to engage with large uh, companies like yourself that uh, there's co-creation of developing and agile ideas, um, and how one feedstock could help um, the circular economy to be fed into a system. For example, you, you touched on coat hangers being, obviously that's out with your, I'm assuming HP don't produce coat hangers. Um, <clears throat> So how, how do you build those relationships with smaller companies to work alongside big companies like yourself to become a feedstock and help each other? Oh gosh, that's a really, really good question. Um, and I, yeah, I, I, think it, I think it's important, and I think there are, uh, I think uh, as, we, as we see this transition, I think there are going to be innovations and ideas that come from companies of all sizes that are going to enable us to learn and going to enable us to uh, enable us to collaborate um, so it'd be really interesting I mean I, you know I, I think HP is a very open company so if there are kind of proposals ideas business opportunities coming from small companies and big companies then yeah we're, we're keen to we're keen to, to, to hear from that at the moment one of the things you know I, I mentioned at the start that we see ourselves as a starter and we see the op the, an opportunity of the circular economy providing us with business opportunities. So, for example, we're stepping into this, uh, this, this area of asset management. And rather than just providing a recycling service, seeing whether we can work with our customers to take equipment that still has a value, um, reuse that equipment, and share the profit from that with our customers. So we're kind of seeing ourselves almost as a small company working with our, our customers on this. But if there, if there are business ideas that, um, that would enable us to, to, to accelerate this transition, then I think we'd be interested to hear them. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, put my hands up, I think this is where we come in, Zero Waste Scotland. So uh, one of the, which is I think why this is so exciting, this idea of the circular economy. So uh, the work that we do working with businesses is about that idea of collaboration, bringing different companies at different sizes and different sectors together. And, and one of the most exciting things we're involved in is actually here in Glasgow, uh, working with the Chamber of Commerce. I think there are people here from the Chamber of Commerce, Glasgow Chamber of Commerce, uh, where we've you know, worked with them to provide a kind of almost a, a co-creation space to bring different companies together, not just to look at their own opportunity around uh, the circular economy, but how they could work in collaboration with different companies uh, in the same location at different sizes. And that's, and that's really, I think, what's really different about the circular economy. When you look about, even with every respect, resource efficiency and some of the sustainability stuff, certainly that I've been involved in, it has been a kind of sector approach. So with every respect, uh, sort of Hewlett Packard types of companies will come together and you'll talk about the challenges and we've done a lot of work with whiskey industry companies who are very think they think about the, the common the common challenges they have. But the idea of the circular economy is really taking off because different companies are coming together and collaborating and understanding that they can work with each other's kind of resources and their off you know, the outputs and uh, in a different way and bring that together in a much more exciting thing both to help each other save money or to look at uh, profitability and then or actually to set up new initiatives and bring people so I really think that's that's the exciting thing about the circular economy so our work particularly with the likes of the Chamber of Commerce here in Glasgow and other parts of Scotland is really bringing that together through workshops you know lectures like this just trying to get people to spark off each other and have that conversation so that's that's i think and i think that creates us with every respect a safe space for people the bigger companies to come and i think you know our, our sense is that they enjoy that because they kind of get out of that usual sector space where it's usually just looking at common challenges and there's a bit of possibly competitiveness that uh, they, they, they doesn't allow them possibly to have that same conversation okay Thank, thank you, um, and thanks for the responses, and, and, and thanks for, for the questions, guys. Um, that's probably all we've got what, time for, uh, for for this part of, of, of the evening. Um, so before we, we do break for refreshments and a bit of networking, I'd just like to ask you to thank the speakers in the normal way. So thank, thank you. Thank you.